to it on my laptop, so I have no idea what's happening. I know, yeah, my laptop just occasionally has a bit of a... It's a university-managed one, so it just has a meltdown occasionally. Right. <laughs> See, it won't, it won't even go on the UOM one, so it's obviously just the, the laptop, it's not the... Anyway, I can run it off my phone, it's fine. Morning, morning. How are you all doing? So there is a Mentimeter set up for you all to kick off, um, have a look. I'm liking the answers so far. I don't know what we're supposed to be tricking the aliens about, but. <laughs> yes, we have. Yes, we have sent, sent things out trying to communicate with, with other aliens if they're out there. But hopefully not to trick them. No space elevators yet, good point, good point. Right, I really like this actually, and what's interesting is that I think because I work in, in space, I assume that everyone knows exactly what's going on above our heads. And you've covered a lot of stuff, but actually there's quite a variety of answers, so I'm hoping actually you'll find it quite interesting when we get to the end of this and talk about why in the world we actually would want to launch spacecraft. Um, two quick announcements just before we kick off. One, thank you to the people who pointed out that my maths was wrong on Thursday for the hyperbolic uh, proof. I have had a look at it over the weekend and now understand what I did wrong. Um, so that will go up on Piazza at some point. Um, the answer was right, though, which is interesting. Uh, so yes, thank you to the people who pointed that out. I much appreciated. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say was I just want to remind you all to please, please take the time to work through all the quizzes on Blackboard. Yes, there's a weekly quiz. Um, hopefully you'll have seen by now that the way we're kind of choosing to run this is that we're spending the, the lecture time to kind of go through the theoretical concepts and really get them clear in your head. The quizzes are an opportunity for you then to actually practice what you've learned, particularly using the equations and things that we've derived to actually do some calculations and apply them to orbits. The questions that are on the quizzes are very, very representative of what you'll see on the exam. So I would really encourage you to go through those. Um, if you want to do well in this class, that is a really, really good way to make sure that you understand what's going on. Okay, that's my two announcements, and then we are going to kick off. All right, so um, none of this should be strange to you. We're now on section five, looking at Earth orbits. Uh, the things that we want to take away from this, uh, this block, so from this week, is to think about how the Earth moves around the sun and also about how satellites move around the Earth. And particularly, we're going to be looking at the Keplerian orbit elements. And we're going to spend a lot of time on that today. Uh, we're going to think about the main types of Earth orbits, the pros and cons of them, and what we might use them for. Um, and then we're going to think about the ground tracks, so what they actually see on the Earth, if you want to think about it like that, um, and what, how we relate those to the orbits themselves. In fact, I'm going to move this. Hang on a second. Let me rearrange the table. Ta-da! Okay. 
All right, so I asked you to look at um, the coordinate systems and the time systems yourselves in the course notes before today, because I really don't want to have to spend too long on them. So um, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Sorry, I'll just set my timer up so I know what I'm doing. Um, but basically what I want you to take away from this is that it's really important to understand what coordinate system we're working in. On the Earth, we're very used to everything kind of working in three dimensions, right, relative to presumably the ground we're standing on, generally speaking. In space, everything is moving in different directions, things are angled in different directions, and so it's not always obvious what coordinate system we should be using. Where is zero, basically? Um, and so, ultimately, depending on what we're trying to do, we pick a different coordinate system that's going to help us do the things that we want to do. So to give you an example of this, if we're looking at the sun as being at the center of what we're studying and how the earth moves around the sun, the earth is actually tilted relative to the sun. So if we take the sun's equator, basically, and the plane that the earth orbits in, the earth is tilted relative to that. The north pole and the south pole are tilted relative to that orbit plane. And so what that means is basically that the equator of the earth and the plane that it orbits in are not aligned. So depending on whether you choose to put the sun upright or whether you choose to put the earth upright, your zero plane, your x-axis, is actually different, right? So if we're looking at the earth as being upright, then the x-axis through the center of the equator actually slices at an angle through the sun, if you want. And if we take the sun as being upright and we take the plane of the equator of the sun as our x-axis or our zero, then that actually slices through sort of an angle across the Earth, right? And that's what these images are trying to show you. So it's really important that we think about what coordinate system works for what we're trying to do, and we use the one that's most appropriate. So if we're trying to look at things orbiting the Sun, we tend to use a coordinate system centered on the Sun. If we want to look at things orbiting the Earth, we tend to use a coordinate system that's centered on the Earth, right? So that is basically um, the difference there. So I'm not going to dwell on it. There's more in the notes. Hopefully you've gone through that. Um, but it's just to say that these are different and they are important. So a really quick thing that I do want to spend some time on is the idea of the vernal equinox. And the reason I want to spend some time on this is that it's relevant for uh, the sort of Keplerian orbital parameters that we're going to talk about in a minute. So the vernal equinox, it, oh, it'll also come up when you come onto your thermal section as well. It's so also relevant for that. So the vernal equinox is basically, and this is a very basic example because I had a discussion with an astronomer at the weekend and he told me this was too simplified, but we're going with it. So the vernal equinox is essentially that on the first day of the sort of celestial spring, if you want, as opposed to the meteorological spring, the line that passes through the Earth and the Sun gives you that vernal equinox. Or as an astronomer explained it to me, it is the point at which the sun passes over the equator of the Earth. So again, thinking about the fact that those coordinate systems aren't aligned, the sun's passage relative to the Earth is tilted. So at the point where it appears above the Earth's, uh, the Earth's equator, basically. You don't need to worry too much about exactly the, the definition of the vernal equinox in various different uh, ways, but the importance I think to remember is that it is a fixed, it is a fixed direction that is independent of the motion of the Earth that we can use to benchmark things against. Right. So it's basically the idea of if the Earth is moving, if the Sun is moving, if everything's moving, where, how in the world do we work out how everything is relevant relative to each other? And this is kind of the fixed line that we use as a reference for an awful lot of motion. So for people who maybe have done astronomy and are familiar with it, when you measure right ascension of uh, astronomical bodies, and we'll talk about how that relates to satellites in a minute, this is sort of your zero line where you measure your right ascension from. Okay. That's basically all I wanted to say on the foundational stuff. And now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the orbit elements because these are basically like your ABCs of orbit mechanics. You have to be familiar with these and you have to know how to use them. They are the fundamental language that we use to describe how orbits are, what shape they are, how they exist. Um, and if you ever want to work in this industry, this is the language that you're going to be using. So I really want to make sure that we get this right. So again, I asked you to have a look at this. Hopefully you did. The key thing I want to, to have as the foundation of this is, again, thinking about the coordinate system that we're using. 
So we're talking about things orbiting the Earth. We're talking about satellites. So we're going to use an Earth-centered coordinate system, which makes sense. So we put the origin of our coordinate system at the center of the Earth, right? We don't put it at Jupiter. We don't put it at the Sun. We put it at the center of the Earth, because that just makes our life easier. We put it aligned with the equator, because again, the Earth's tilt is, is, you know, the Earth is tilted relative to the Sun and so on, so we have to pick a zero. For our convenience, we tend to pick the equator, so we can put the Earth upright, the North Pole and the South Pole run up and down, um, and it just, again, makes things a little bit easier. So our equator is horizontal in this coordinate system. And the big difference compared to some other Earth-centered coordinate systems is that this coordinate system does not rotate with the Earth. So obviously the Earth itself is rotating around its axis. So if we were to, ch and so we can have an Earth-centered inertial or an Earth-centered fixed coordinate system. And again, these are in your notes. Fixed just means we fix it to the Earth. So if we decide that uh, Greenwich, um, which is where we'd normally pick, that that's the, the zero line of longitude, if we decide that that is zero, Greenwich remains zero, even as the Earth spins, right? In this coordinate system, it's what we call inertial, which means that it's fixed in space. It's not fixed to the Earth. So we might pick Greenwich as being zero at the start of our um, whatever, we're, whatever our analysis is. But as the Earth spins, Greenwich will now change its, uh, its angle in this coordinate system, right? Zero stays fixed relative to the stars. Yeah, it's not fixed relative to the Earth. So the Earth spins within this coordinate system. The reason we choose to do it that way is that we want to know where our satellites are relative to each other, generally speaking, and they're not spinning with the Earth. So it would just make things more confusing if we had to account for the Earth's spin all the time. Any questions on that? Because it is quite important to be clear on. Yes? The zero point of origin for the Earth's centered inertial reference frame is at the center of the Earth, right? Yes. Correct. Excellent. And well summarized. Thank you. Wait, wait, this is, but this is not all we need to know for the examination. Right? There's more. There's more. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. So let's talk about each of these orbit elements in order and think about them. So I'm not going to dwell on the first two because we've done them already and you should hopefully be familiar, but I do want to clear up some areas of confusion. So the first one that we're thinking about is the semi major axis. So as I have said, the semi major axis is basically. This, if we have an elliptical orbit, the major axis is the long line along the orbit, and the semi-major axis is half of that, right? So we've done this quite a few times. Hopefully that all makes sense. This diagram is what I want to focus on, because these are the things that tend to confuse people. So do not get any of these parameters mixed up with each other, because they will all come up in various different forms of another, and you need to remember which one is which. This is, like I would say, a good chunk of the mistakes I tend to see in the exam. So make sure you get these right. This here is the radius of the Earth, right? The Earth has a radius. This here, h, is the altitude of the satellite. So the altitude of the satellite is its height above the surface of the Earth, yeah? Okay? The radius is the line between the center of the Earth and wherever our satellite happens to be on its path. At this point, it happens to be at the apogee, so the radius is running that very long distance. If you add the radius of the Earth to the altitude, which I've written as h here, that will be the same as the radius, yeah? regardless of where you are in the orbit. So if our satellite was over at the perigee, the radius of the Earth wouldn't change, but the altitude would. The altitude would be a lot lower because it's much closer to the Earth at the perigee. Yeah? So the altitude has changed. The radius of the Earth has ch not changed. The radius of the Earth has stayed the same, but the radius to our satellite at that point, our R value has changed. Yeah? The semi-major axis, our A value, never changes. It is a property of the orbit. It has nothing to do with where our satellite is. It is a property that defines the orbit. So the altitude defines where the satellite is within that path. The radius defines where the satellite is within that path. Semi-major axis never changes. Yeah? Any questions on that? Does it make sense? Not seeing very much nodding. Does it make sense? Excellent. Good. Thank you very much. All right. 
Eccentricity. Again, I don't want to dwell too much on this because we've gone through it quite a few times. The only thing I wanted to mention was just, I think we, I keep saying eccentricity is how squished the orbit is, um, which for my purposes is quite all right. So I'm happy to accept that. Um, but for some people who might be interested in the geometry of where this comes from, the eccentricity of an ellipse, the simplest way that I, I think of describing it is using what you see here. So A is still our semi-major axis here. And C is the distance between the focus and the center of the ellipse. So one focus is going to be where our planet is in this scenario. The other focus, as we said with Kepler's laws, is empty. There's nothing there. Right? So the other focus will be somewhere over here. Um, so basically, the eccentricity is just the ratio of those two. Yeah? Um, which is why it's zero when it's a circle. Because in a circle, your, your focus is at the center. So your C value is zero. So you're dividing by zero, so it becomes zero. This is not something you particularly need to know, but it's just for people who might find that helpful to understand where that eccentricity number actually comes from. So that is basically how squished your orbit is. Again, this is an orbit property. It's defined by the orbit. There's no satellites. It doesn't matter where your satellite is. The eccentricity is always the same. Does that make sense? OK. Yes? You did say you might not need to know that equation, but for just the sake of it, would we ever be asked in an exam, for example, to define C for no, I'm not, no, I wouldn't touch on this because it's a geometric property. It's more just to do with geometry. However, you will have seen in the last lecture, or certainly one of the lectures we did last week, we do have equations where you can relate the eccentricity to the semi-major axis via the radius, for example. Um, and so those ones would be used. So if we're going to be doing any calculations on orbits, we'll always be using the orbit elements. We wouldn't be using these particular parameters. That makes sense? Yeah, cool. Good. Great question. Right. Uh, oh, this was a little video I found that I quite liked because it shows how the orbits change as the eccentricity changes. So not only do they get more squished, but also sort of the, the location of the planet doesn't change, but kind of the orbit shifts sideways almost, right? Because the focus, if we think about that C value, that focus moves as well. So in a circular orbit, it's at the center, but in a very eccentric orbit, it's off to the side. So I just thought this was quite a nice animation to kind of understand what happens as you just change the eccentricity. Nothing else is changing in these orbits. And also you can see how the relative motion changes for each of these example satellites. OK, we're now going to move on to the slightly more tricky things. Um, and these are slightly more tricky only because they only really work in 3D. <laughs> so it's really hard to do this on slides. Hence why I have a hula hoop and a pumpkin. So, um, right, so the first thing that we're going to start with is the inclination. So the inclination of an orbit, I think, is the most straightforward one, because I think it's relatively easy to understand. So I will talk through a little bit uh, what's on the sides, so that when you have them away with you afterwards and you don't have a pumpkin, uh, you can still work with this. Um, I always keep an orange at my desk, excellent to draw on, uh, if, you're, if you're ever trying to do orbit mechanics -y type stuff. But anyway, so I'll go through the slides so you have those, and then we'll think about what it means physically. So this image, the idea is that we are looking at the Earth's side on, yeah? And we can see the equator through it. And I've just drawn the orbit at a slight angle so you can imagine that we're kind of looking at it side on, but it is a 3D orbit, right? So this is if you were looking at it exactly side on now. So the orbit is not a straight line. <laughs> the orbit is still an ellipse, but we're looking at it side on so we can only see the side of it. And that angle that the orbit makes with the equator is its inclination. So um, if I, in fact, do you want to be my demo person? <laughs> I was going to get a volunteer, but since you're here, I'll <laughs> save someone else. So if you just want to hold a pumpkin aloft. <laughs> so if this is our Earth, this is our orbit, then our inclination is when we tilt it that way. Yeah? So this angle here between the sort of highest point of the orbit and the equator gives us our inclination. So this would be a zero inclination orbit. That, that way <laughs> would be a 90 degree inclination orbit and all the things in between. I mean, I'm going to need you in a second, yeah. so feel free to hover. <laughs> all right, any questions on that? Yes? So the angle of the orbital plane relative to the equatorial plane is the best way to say inclination. Exactly, That's excellent. Awesome. Couldn't say it better myself. Thank you very much. Yes? Um, so it's only between zero and 90? No. So, <laughs> uh, we'll do it again. All right, so yes, so good question. So we start at zero. Uh, 
let's go that way, so this would be 90 degrees. If we tilt over further, we can get to say 180 degrees. The difference between zero and 180 degrees is the direction the satellite is moving. So in terms of defining the orbit itself, you know, you could kind of think of it as being that, but the difference is the way the, the satellite is moving. So if we're in a zero to 90 degree orbit, we're in something that we call a prograde orbit, which means that the satellite moves in the same direction that the Earth rotates. So if the Earth rotates that way, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Earth goes that way, right? So then the satellite would also be going that way. Yeah, and if we're up at, Da, 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 at some sort of 45 degree angle, we're all still going in the same direction. Thank you, this is really helpful. <laughs> if we're in a 180 degree orbit, then the Earth goes that way, but the satellite goes the opposite. Oh, the other way, oh, the opposite direction, thank you. <laughs> right, so that's what we call a retrograde orbit. And again, if we were tilted, then we're going in opposite directions. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you. So that's, um, so that's basically the difference between those two. So. It, it, the reason it makes a little bit of difference, it doesn't make a great deal of difference to the satellite, but it'll make a deal of difference to what you're seeing on the ground. So if you imagine, for example, if you're in a zero degree orbit and you're moving over the equator, you're going to pass over the areas on the ground at one speed. If you're in a 180 degree orbit and you're moving against the spin of the Earth, then you're going to pass overhead much more quickly, right? Because the relative velocity with what's passing between you will be higher. Yeah, so it makes a difference for the ground tracks, which we're going to talk about on Thursday, but in terms of the actual spacecraft, it doesn't make too much difference. Great question, thank you. You were whispering at me anyway, you were like, you need to tell me that. <laughs> Good, okay, excellent. So that's exactly what we've just looked at. Equator is zero, uh, inclination is zero, inclination is 90 degrees. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one, unless there's any questions on inclination, but I think we've covered it pretty much, yeah. So the next one is right ascension of the ascending node, which is a mouthful, and so we call it RAN. Um, but the actual meaning is relatively helpful because it helps us break down what it actually is. So first of all, we need to know what an ascending node is. So again, we're looking at the Earth side on. It's got an equator through the middle of it, and it's got an orbit going around it. And what I've marked is something called the line of nodes. Now, the line of nodes is basically... If you were to draw a line between the two points on the orbit where it crosses the equator. So if you drew a line through the Earth at the equator where it pierced the orbit, that's your line of nodes. Yeah? So it's straight through your orbit and through the center of the Earth at the equator. That is your line of nodes. And the ascending node then is the point where the satellite is going up the way. The descending node is where the satellite is going down the way. So again, if we're in here, here's our line of nodes. Oh, I brought a satellite. Right. <laughs> so if the satellite is coming down this way, it hits, wait, sorry, I'm trying to hit you in the face. It hits here. This is our descending node because it's on its way down. And as it comes the whole way around and it passes the equator again, that's its ascending node. Right, so that is our ascending node. So that's the first thing you need to know. The second thing is once we know where our ascending node is, then we want to know what its right ascension is. So now we've moved into a top-down view. You can see why this is difficult on slides. <laughs> so we've moved into a top-down view where we're looking at the line of nodes. You can't see the orbit on this because the orbit is aligned with the line of nodes, right? So everything's in a line here. And we talked about the vernal equinox before. So the vernal equinox, we said, was this kind of fixed direction in space. And so our right ascension is measured relative to that. So again, if we've got our pumpkin, what way am I going to do this? Right, so let's go this way. You're going to be the vernal equinox. He's got, we've got a finger, we've got a vernal equinox, right? So the angle that we're measuring is from the vernal equinox to our ascending node, which we said was over here. I'll put my satellite back on. Right, so if we were, and, and basically what it's doing is, I always think of it, if you were to put a pin through the north and south pole of the Earth, and rotate your orbit around that line, that is what your right ascension is. So it's basically the twist of the orbit, right? So if you think about the inclination as the tilt, the right ascension is the twist. So if we were aligned that way, that would be a zero right ascension because our ascending node is lined up with our vernal equinox. If we swivel it around this way, that would be like 180 degrees right ascension, and this would be 90 degrees right ascension. 
And by convention, we measure it in a particular direction. So by convention, we measure it to the east, which I have drawn on the slide. But yeah, it's just by convention we've picked a direction to make it positive. The ran is the one that confuses people the most, I think. But if you think about inclination as tilt and that as twist around like the North Pole and the South Pole, I think that helps. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Let's go through it again slowly. Okay, so we've got our, uh, our orbit. Let, let's do it at 90 degrees, actually, because that's probably a little bit easier to see. Right, so we've got our orbit. The point at which we call our line of nodes is where we draw a line straight through from the, in the line of the equator, straight through our orbit on one side, through the center of the Earth, and out the other side in line with the equator. That is our line of nodes. Where we descend, so where the satellite is coming down as it goes over the equator, is our descending node. And where it goes up as it goes over the equator is our ascending <laughs> node. And in fact, do you want to rotate? And I'll rotate. Like, you go that way, so we can point that way. Let's do that way. Right, OK? So we've got our ascending node over here. This is our vernal equinox, which, for all intents and purposes, we'll just say is a fixed direction in space. And what we measure is the angle between our ascending node and our vernal equinox. And this gives us our right ascension. So if we were going that direction, that would be a zero right ascension because they're aligned. This would be a 90 degree right ascension. This would be 180 degree right ascension. So, if, so that's at 90 degrees. If you tilt, the same process applies, but it's just now you've got an inclined orbit. So you're kind of, it's a little bit more tricky, I suppose, to see, but that would be zero. That would be 90, and that would be 180. Does that help? Good. Yeah. Well, the line of nodes is a property of the orbit because it's where the orbit crosses the equator, essentially. So when your satellite is traveling around, it's only going to cross the equator at two points. Right? We're not touching the equator. We're not touching the equator. We're not touching the equator. Equator! We're not touching the equator, we're not touching the equator, we're not touching the equator. Equator! Right? So we've got two points where we pass through the equator. Those are your line of nodes. If you draw a line between those two points. Yeah, good point. That was, thank you. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> equatorial orbit is always a good question. An equatorial orbit does not have a right ascension. Right? Because there's no ascending node. It's just always in the equatorial plane. So we don't have a right ascension when we're in an equatorial orbit. Yes? What's the significance of this right ascension? So the significance of the right ascension is it's basically how we describe an orbit. So let's say that I want to launch a satellite to do a particular job. And I would tell someone, I want my satellite to be in an orbit that's inclined at 45 degrees, for example, and it has a right ascension of 20 degrees. And what it does is it orients it in space. So it'll orient it relative to all the other satellites because we'll know their right ascensions and their inclinations. But the other thing that it will do is if we also specify a time when we're putting it into orbit, it will orient it relative to the Earth. So if, for example, we decided that we wanted to be passing over a certain region of the Earth at a certain time, that right ascension helps us to achieve that. Okay, and we'll talk again a little bit about that when we cover ground tracks on Thursday. But that's basically why it's how we define our orbit. Does that make sense? Great question, thank you. Okay, anything else on that? Yeah? Is up and down just relative to where the equator is? Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, so basically, um, I think I did it on the next slide. So if you're looking at a top-down view of the Earth and you're thinking about which direction do we measure our right ascension from the vernal equinox, then we measure it to, I'm terrible at directions, we measure it to the east from the vernal equinox, right? So it's just a convention. So again, if we're thinking about it here, this is 90 degrees because our vernal equinox is here, so we're going east, yeah? Um, and if we're over this way and this is our ascending node, then this would be 270 degrees because we measure the whole way around. Good question. Right. Anything else on that? I know it is the most confusing one, but hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Yeah.
So that's a top-down view. So if we tilt our pumpkin, so tilt our pumpkin this way, so now our North Pole is coming out to you guys. Okay. Yeah, so then our line of nodes is basically going straight through, uh, let me do it that way, right? <laughs> it's going straight through that way. So if you're looking at it here, that's why you're getting a straight line, because it's going straight through the middle. Okay. Yeah? Right. Does that make sense? I'm not sure you still trust me, but. No, no, <laughs> okay. I know this is the most confusing, so take some time, um, see if it makes sense, and we can always come back to it, yeah? Yes? Yes, sorry, good question, yeah. So Omega, so you'll see at the top it's a bit small, but you've got the different names and then the, the labels as well, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So what we've just talked about here, so that's those guys, yeah. Okay, let's move on because we've got a few more to cover. Oh, yeah, sorry, that's what the last thing I wanted to say on this is the RAN is not related to the Earth again. So if we take the Earth out, the vernal equinox still exists, right? So it's something that we've oriented in space. It doesn't matter whether the Earth is where the Earth is or how it's rotating, it's relative to that vernal equinox point. All right, argument of perigee. This is slightly harder to do because my hula hoop is circular. Um, so this, this, what was our satellite is now becoming our perigee, right? So this is gonna mark the perigee of the orbit. So, and the perigee of our orbit is where the satellite is passing closest to the Earth, yeah? Okay, so the argument of perigee obviously doesn't exist for a circular orbit because we don't have a perigee. But when we do have a perigee, then the argument of perigee basically tells us where that, closest point is in the orbit. So if you think about how we've just defined things, we've said, okay, I've got my orbit, I'm putting it here, right? I know how inclined it is, I know how twisted it is, but now what I need to know is, well, where, oh, sorry, I'm trying to whack you in the face, um, where is that perigee? Is the perigee like up here, or is the perigee down here, yeah? So that's what our argument of perigee is telling us. So again, it's another twist, but it's a twist in a different direction. So it, this one I think makes sense, right? Because you know what your perigee is and it's basically just where your perigee is. Um, and again, thinking about where we're measuring this from, I think I show it, do I show it on the next page? Yeah, okay, so basically, so we're measuring it from our line of nodes again, so essentially from the equator uh, for all intents and purposes. So we've got our perigee down here and basically we're measuring it from the line of nodes following the direction of motion of the satellite. Yeah, so if, uh, now I have no satellite, but if my satellite is going that direction, then I'm measuring it from my ascending node, which we'll say is here, the whole way around to give me the argument of perigee down here. All right, and if my argument of perigee whoop, was up here, then, and this was my ascending node, then I would just be measuring that angle. So to a certain extent, if you think about it, when you think about the ascend ascending node and where that's going to be, it's always gonna be on the equator, so if you are, um, if your satellite is traveling this direction, so it's going, well it has to be, it has to be going up past the ascending node, right? So if you've got an argument of perigee less than 180 degrees, then your perigee is basically in the northern hemisphere somewhere. And if you've got an argument of perigee more than 180 degrees, then it has to be down here. That one I don't think is too complicated, but any questions on that? No, and obviously only exists in uh, elliptical orbits, not in circular orbits. Yeah. Can the argument of perigee be zero? Yes, so if the, arg if the perigee was aligned with the ascending node, then that would be a zero argument of perigee. Yep. Yes. How does this work for equatorial orbits? For equatorial orbits, it's still the same. Uh, oh, because you don't have an ascending node. Good point. So I think if you don't have an ascending node, you use the vernal equinox. Yeah. So if you don't have an ascending node, then you use the vernal equinox, which is what we looked at in the last slide. Excellent question. I was like, wait a second, how do you do that? So yeah, so you can still obviously have an, uh, an elliptical orbit in the equator, and then you're measuring from um, this vernal equinox point that we defined before. Great question. You're all determined to catch me out this morning. Anything else? Good, okay, last one. Oh, yeah, this is just, again, just a diagram, so you can take that away with you. 
True anomaly. So true anomaly is the only what we call fast variable. So all of the other um, all of the other Keplerian elements or orbital elements, although some of them use the satellite's motion to define their direction, in and of themselves, they tell us about the orbit. They don't tell us anything about where the satellite is. Yeah, so even though we use things like the ascending node, which are relative to how the satellite moves, the orbits themselves, it's just defining the orbit, right? The inclination defines the orbit, the RAN defines the orbit. The true anomaly is the only thing that tells us where the satellite is in that orbit. And so we call it a fast variable because all of the other ones, they can change under certain circumstances, but they do it very, very slowly. So you're talking about things changing on the order of years or decades or, or whatever. Whereas the position of a satellite it will obviously be changing very, very quickly. So if you remember back, we started calculating what the velocity of satellites were at one point, and we were talking about on the order of seven kilometers a second, fairly fast. So this is what we call our fast variable. We measure this from the perigee in an elliptical orbit. So if this is my perigee, because I'm, uh, you see I'm close there at this end, then the true anomaly is measured in the direction of motion of the satellite to where it is relative to the perigee. So if the satellite is at the perigee, then it has a zero degrees true anomaly. And if it's all the way up at the apogee, then it has a 180 degrees true anomaly. If we are in a circular orbit, then did I put this in? Oh, I didn't. That's really annoying. Uh, so if we are in our circular orbit, we measure from the equator. Thank you, someone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, we do. Because your argument of latitude is just, yeah, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> moment of checking. <laughs> if you're in a circular orbit, you measure from the equator. Right, that gives you your true anomaly. Okay, so at the ascend, well, from the ascending node, sorry, not from the equator, bad phrasing. You measure from the ascending node. Yeah, so if you're at the ascending node in a circular orbit, then your true anomaly is zero. And if you're at the descending node, then it's 180. Okay? And if you're in an equatorial, it's much more than Yes, of course, you're cheaper. <laughs> and if you're in an equatorial circular orbit, just to confuse matters, thank you, Ian, then you're measuring from the uh, vernal equinox again, right? So that fixed point in space. So basically, if you don't have an axis to define it off, you revert back to the previous one that you used. So in terms of if you can define it off the perigee, you do. If, that, if you don't have a perigee, you define it off the ascending node. And if you don't have an ascending node, you define it off the vernal equinox. So you kind of just revert back to your previous baseline. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, that's, I'm done with you now. Thank you very much. Round of applause for Ian, please. Okay, take some time over these, do get to grips with them, they are a bit weird, um, but they're, yeah, the bread and butter of orbit mechanics, so it's worth getting familiar with them, okay? Yeah, of course, yeah, with the GMAT you're going to be putting these well into practice, right? So you'll be very, very familiar with them by the time you've done all the GMAT coursework, um, and we'll talk about ground tracks on Thursday, which will also kind of hammer this home a little bit more as well as to why we care about them and stuff. Okay. To finish off then, I just want to quickly talk about why we would launch satellites. So coming back to that question that I asked you at the start, like why in the world do we bother? Because it seems like an awful lot of hard work, <laughs> right? So, um, and a lot of you actually talked about things like scientific research, talked about exploring the solar system, um, talked about trying to find aliens, uh, lots of different things like that. So there was a lot of focus on research and scientific explanation, exploration. So I think a lot of people, so first of all, these are probably out of date because I think I did these slides uh, using data from January, um, but they won't be far off. So um, I think it's interesting to think about how the satellites uh, that we have in orbit are actually broken down. So this is only for low Earth orbit, um, which we'll talk about again on Thursday what that means, but it's fairly representative of what's going on in the rest of, of uh, space. So the vast majority of the satellites that we have in or orbit are communication satellites. Um, interestingly, this has generally been the case. 
Um, but obviously it's gotten significantly larger with the launch of things like Starlink and OneWeb over the last few years. So for people who maybe aren't familiar, so Starlink is a constellation from SpaceX. Um, OneWeb is their own company. They're, there's other ones as well, but they're all trying to do basically provide global internet from space. And to do that, they need on the order of thousands of satellites. And so when we've seen them launching over the last couple of years, we've seen a massive increase in the number of communication satellites that are existing in low Earth orbit. Um, but even going back before the dawn of these kind of mega constellations, we still had more communication satellites in orbit really than anything else. Um, so things like broadcasting television, for example, uh, things like satellite phones, all of that would be covered under communications. And so that is the vast majority. So not nearly as sexy as hunting for aliens, sadly. Uh, the next chunk is Earth observation, and I've put Earth science in there as well because I'm not entirely sure where you draw the line between Earth observation and Earth science. Um, in a lot of cases, we have Earth observation satellites that scientists will make use of, so I don't like to draw a, a distinct line. Um, but basically, Earth observation is exactly what it sounds like. It's satellites that are up in orbit looking at the Earth, and they are monitoring the Earth to tell us something about it. So we can get satellites that just have cameras on. So companies like Planet Labs, for example, or Planet, as they're now known, out in the US. Um, the European uh, Sentinel-2 spacecraft has an optical camera. Uh, Landsat, which is the NASA one, they all basically just have cameras on them that are looking at the Earth. Complicated cameras that can break down the colors that they're seeing into different wavelengths and, and tell us lots of information, but they are essentially just cameras. Um, and if anyone's interested, you can actually access all of the Sentinel data online for free at a place called, well, you can get it in loads of places. I like Sentinel Hub. Um, and you can just, yeah, get data all the time, any way you want, which is pretty cool. I don't think many people know about that. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so optical imagery, also things like infrared um, you can get. Uh, we also have things that would be monitoring various areas of the atmosphere, so looking at uh, the different breakdown of the atmosphere, that would fall under Earth observation. Um, and the other big sort of section of Earth observation is what we call active instruments. So a camera is passive, right, because you just point and click and you get what you get. You get whatever you see. An active instrument is something like a radar where you send out a signal and it bounces back and you receive that signal. And the information that you get is based on how distorted that signal is when it comes back to you. So uh, we can do that from space as well. So we have lots of radar satellites that basically um, can send out blasts of essentially radar beams. <laughs> I don't think that's the right word. But anyway, they send it out and then they measure what comes back to them. In the simplest version, you're measuring distances. So you can measure topography, height, you can see buildings, you can see mountains, that kind of thing. Um, but depending on how your signal is distorted, you can also measure roughness. So you can tell, for example, the difference between a road and a field. You can tell the difference between a field and a forest. And with really good ones, you can actually tell the difference between like a, for uh, a field that's been harvested and one that hasn't. So we can actually get quite a lot of detail from these, but they're quite complex instruments. Technology demonstration. This actually made up a bigger chunk than I expected, but my inkling is that this covers a lot of like CubeSats and things. So again, for people who might not be familiar, CubeSats are very, very small satellites on the order of like a shoebox, or I always think of them as a Jenga tower. Um, but uh, a lot of universities, a lot of small companies can afford to launch them because they're small and cheap to build and manufacture. Um, Interestingly, in Glasgow, there are more of these manufactured than anywhere in the world outside of California. Um, so they're second only to Planet Labs for, for manufacturing these CubeSats. Um, so I think that's why, it's because it's a really nice way. If you want to put something like one of these instruments into space, like a radar, you have to test it before you can, say, sell it and, and make a commercial constellation and sell your data, for example, because we have to know it's going to work. So what people will do is they will get a cheap satellite, a small satellite, and send it up, and then they can test that their, their instrument works or their new product works or whatever it is. It might be a new material, um, might be a new power system, and they'll check how it works. So everything has to be space tested. So that's why, I, I think that's a surprisingly high number, actually, but it's great to see. Uh, navigation and defense I've lumped together. Don't ask me about defense. I don't know much about what they're doing. Um, and I, I suspect there might be more than 16, but maybe they're sort of captured under one of the other headings or, or something like that. <laughs> 
Well, exactly, yeah. So, as Ian just said, everything the military are doing are communication or Earth observation. So they'll fall into one of the other categories, but there was only 16 that obviously people weren't willing to give a label to as to what in the world they were doing. Um, but navigation, so GPS um, or, or GNSS, as the sort of collective term is, so basically the stuff that makes your Google Maps and your, your GPS in your car work. Um, just to, by way of uh, clarification, I suppose, it's worth knowing the overarching term is actually GNSS. Uh, GPS is a specific system that's owned by the Americans. Uh, Europe has its own system now, which is called Galileo. Uh, China has their own system, which is Beidou. The Russians have GLONASS, uh, and I think the Japanese have one, but the name escapes me. Yeah, Causey Zenith Navigation Satellite System. Is that the Japanese one? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. So the Indians have one as well. So, so there's a few of them around. So GNSS is the overarching term, even though most people will say GPS. Uh, and space science comes in there as one of the smallest categories, actually, at just 108. Now, as I say, this is a little bit out of date, but in terms of scaling, they're not going to change. And those will be things that are actually like telescopes looking out into the, into the solar system. Um, so things like the Hubble Space Telescope, for example. Um, even small satellites, so CubeSats we have doing space science. There's the te uh, not test mission, but there's a Twinkle mission, um, which is looking for exoplanets, I think. Um, so there's various different things like that. But it's actually a really, really small subset of everything that we're doing in space. Most of it is commercial stuff that actually helps us day to day. We're just completely unaware of it. So on that note, rather than boring you with a whole lot of other stuff, I wanted to tell you about a couple of things that I'm involved in, because I thought these are things that I know, um, as examples of what goes on in space. So I will do this really quickly. So this is one project uh, as an example of space science. So this is a project that we're working on here at the university, where we're looking at designing a constellation of these CubeSats to observe the sun. Um, I've said space science, I suppose it could also be considered something else because we're looking at an operational mission, but basically the idea is to observe the sun and provide early warning in case there's going to be any serious solar storms that would pose a risk to uh, the astronauts on the space station, for example, or knocking out satellites or power grids. So um, that's an example of a project that we're working on here. Another example of one that I've worked on in the past is working with archaeologists to see whether we can use satellite data to detect and monitor um, buried archaeological sites. So again, a completely different use um, of satellites and satellite data. Um, so we were basically comparing the imagery that we could get from satellite systems with what we could get from airborne uh, cameras and seeing whether we could do as well as them. The short answer is Scotland's cloudy, um, which is not ideal for satellites. Uh, and, and navigation and tracking one as an example, because we talked about GPS, so GNSS, um, but there are other forms of navigation and tracking. So this is, again, a project I worked on previously, where uh, this company that I mentioned up in Scotland who build all these satellites, um, what they actually use them to do is to track ships, uh, and they're looking to track aircraft as well. So every ship has its own beacon, which gives off a ping basically every couple of minutes. It's normally uh, picked up by other ships so that they don't crash into each other, right? And they know where they are in the dark and out at the deep sea. Um, but these satellites are now powerful enough that they can pick up these signals even though they're quite weak. Um, and using that, then they can basically track and monitor ships so that they know where they are. So it's great for logistics so that, you know, you can tell someone if their delivery is going to be delayed. Um, but also one of the first things that happens if a ship is commandeered by pirates is that they will turn off the tracking beacon. Um, and so normally if this ship is out at the deep ocean, you can't pick up these signals. You only pick them up when the signal is close to the shore. So it's only another ship who would notice if something got turned off. But because we have these satellites now, we're monitoring them all pretty much in real time. So if a ship goes dark, then we know immediately that something's gone wrong. Whereas otherwise, you would have to wait a lot longer for something to get to shore and then realize, oh, where's that ship? And then try and work backwards. Um, so yeah, so this is something else that we can do with satellites. So these are just some really short examples to kind of give you a flavor of why we're launching these things. So it's not pointless, and it's also not just for pure science or pure research. Uh, these are things that we use day to day. We just have no idea what the 5,000 or so of them above our heads are actually doing in many cases. All right, uh, that was a lot of information, I know, but is there any quick questions to finish us off? Nope. Okay, all right, well, thank you all for your attention, and I will see you back here on, well, not here, but on Thursday for some ground track fun. All right, thanks a lot, and thanks for coming and getting out of bed at 9 a.m. on a Monday. I always appreciate it.
<laughs> no, I was just going to pick a volunteer each time, and then I was like... <laughs> Um, I don't have. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. That was me. Um, I don't have any off the top of my head. I basically like. So if we put a slice through there, yeah. then that would be the equation, yeah. right? And then if we had our orbit going around it, like this, it's literally just the point where. Imagine that that was like a sheet of cling film right, going through the middle that showed you the equator. The point where your satellite pops through the cling film is, is your ascending node, and the point where it pops down the other side is your descending node. And if you drew a straight line between those two points, that is your line of node. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's the line through the equator, but it's where the orbit meets the equator. Because obviously okay. over here is also the equator. The yeah. equator is going yeah. in every direction. Oh, so it's the point okay. where the orbit meets the equator. Oh, okay. Does that make yeah. sense? Thanks. Yeah. Do you know the um, equator? Yeah. So when it comes up the equator, that's positive when it goes down. Yeah. If you're in the northern hemisphere and you're looking, and if you're in the southern hemisphere, those would flip. So it's northern always up. Yeah, by by convention. Yeah. So when you say you're ascending, it's always coming Going to northern north. out, northern hemisphere. It, as as is tradition, we've decided yeah. to, to dominate and make it the way we like it. <laughs> Good question. Just going to ask very quickly about the third year individual project. I was told by my academic advisor that I could go straight to a lecturer yeah. and ask if they'd be okay with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I haven't. Started. I just wanted to ask in advance. Maybe I could maybe give you some kind of document. In. When I know more than a month or so. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then if, yeah. yeah, that would be great. So I love the uh, if you can self-propose individual projects because it tends to work so much better for everyone involved. Um, the timeline for it's actually quite late. So I've done it this year with a couple of people, and I think we kind of sorted it out in like April, May kind of time. So there's no massive rush, but obviously the sooner you can get it done, the better. Um, mm. And mainly the thing is just to think about what kind of stuff you'd like to work on. Let's um, do some research and then maybe like, uh, well I've told my friend, like, you might want to like, tweak it a little bit. Yeah, yeah fully exactly. Understandable. So, like, maybe if it's too far to be tweaked, then you can maybe point me in a direction or something. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So I'd say the best thing is, if you have a think about what kind of stuff you might be interested in, send me an email with a couple of bullet points maybe, mm -hmm. um, and then we can set up a meeting and sit down and have a chat and kind of hash out some ideas. But um, what was your name, sorry? Canon. Callum, so I know I have to look out for it. <laughs> but yeah, that would be great, absolutely. No problem. Thanks. The CANSATs. Uh, no, so I'm the academic advisor for MANSEDS, um, okay. but one of my colleagues is involved with CANSATs. Okay, so I just want to ask because I want to do what I want to know what kind of work you'd be doing with it. Yeah, so I don't know massively. Um, the, the slide, though, has a contact email for the girl who's the president, okay. Emma Kirby. So I would email her mm -hmm. um, and just see. But yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure what they're working on at the moment. But I think it's basically like a satellite design. Um, so looking at like a CANSAT design. Thank you, Eden, for your star. Um, so thinking about like what size it would be, how you would power it, all that kind of stuff. Um, okay. so, but yeah, I would suggest emailing her. It's probably the best thing. I also said you another email, but just if you are more concerned about how you could bring into past papers if you want to do it either. Ah, okay. Um, Kate's in charge of that. Mm -hmm. I will have a look back through. I don't remember seeing that, but it's probably very in my email from when I was out of office. Yeah. So um, the best thing to do is to, to be honest, I think just put the question on the piazza, because then Kate will definitely see it. So if you don't mind just putting that on the piazza, then she's in charge of that. Okay, we'll right. And we'll figure that out. All right? Sure I think they will come out, it just might be a bit later. Okay. No problem. Pulse. 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 Pulse.